Vladimir Putin said it would be a three-day war, but his invasion in Ukraine has not gone to plan. One year on, the atrocities continue, with both sides refusing to back down. So much has been lost for so little gain. But that's not what Putin had planned as he prepared his attack. On the roads into Ukraine, what Russia calls peacekeepers, convoys are. Peace, according to President Putin, needs this much muscle. Mixed in with relentless sounds of shelling and rising smoke. This is the beginning of a Russian invasion of Ukraine. He's setting up a rationale to take more territory by force. Starting first with Donetsk and Luhansk, taking not just areas controlled by Russian rebels, but also the Ukrainian government. February 23, 2022, Russia orders troops into Ukraine's east to Donetsk and Luhansk. Ukraine declares a state of emergency. Then, the following day, Russia advances its move. Russian soldiers are on reconnaissance. You can hear down there, that's just a couple of kilometres away. That's small arms fire, some sort of machine gun. That's an exchange of gunfire. Putin declares a special military operation in eastern Ukraine. He claims the move is a peacekeeping mission. By land, sea and air, the invasion begins. This is the front line in the war in Ukraine. Just four kilometres down that road is the main body of the Russian forces, but they have other units, uh, we're told, within 500 metres to a kilometre away. Just down that road there. Sirens blare in the capital of Kyiv. Threats are made to assassinate Ukrainian President Zelensky, who refuses a US offer to evacuate, reportedly saying on a call to Joe Biden, I need more ammunition, not a ride. A defiant Zelensky films himself walking through the streets of Kyiv, delivering a clear and compelling message. I am here. We will not lay down any weapons. Fighting is closer by the day. We visited that front line today. This area is the capital city's limit, and it's fiercely contested. Here in northern Kyiv, the streets are littered with evidence of running street battles with the Russians. Civilian car over here, and over here, an armoured personnel carrier taken out. It's a Ukrainian vehicle taken out by the Russians. But Ukraine has held this position for now, and their soldiers are telling us that the Russians are having major fuel supply issues, and they are stuck just north of here. But they are still sending in lethal fire. There's not much left of the vehicle at all. If you just check out inside here, evidence of some severe fire damage. It is burned to a crisp. The world reacts. Condemnation is swift. We've got to do everything we can to change the, the heavy odds that Ukraine faces and, uh, and to help them. And so that's why uh, we're sending uh, humanitarian supplies, we're sending uh, financial supplies and military supplies. Without provocation, <clears throat> without justification, without necessity, this is a premeditated attack. The US and much of Europe slap sanctions on Russia's central bank and on numerous powerful Russian oligarchs. Signing sanctions into law now that the invasion is on going further, widening the sanctions that cover all members of Russia's parliament, senior military leaders and four more financial institutions. We must ensure there is a cost for this violent, unacceptable and egregious behaviour. We have to face the possibility that none of our messages has been heeded and that Putin is implacably determined to go further in subjugating and tormenting Ukraine. We will not surrender. We will not capitulate. We will not give up a single inch of our territory. Putin reacts by putting Russia's nuclear forces on alert. NATO countries are making aggressive statements with regards to our country. 
Therefore, I order you to transfer the deterrent forces of the Russian army to a special mode of combat duty. Just understand, and don't kid yourself, no matter what you all say, that's called World War III. March begins with a mass exodus from Ukraine as residents attempt to flee the war zone. And with good reason, as Russia's invasion ramps up. Every single room in the wings either side has been devastated. They did not miss. Now down here, a couple of pieces of the shell casing. Our security expert has told us that is straight from the missile itself. So you look at something like this and you think, why would the Russians have targeted this building? What strategic value? Was it some sort of military facility? We can answer that with this, the textbook. Fingers, nails, it's a cosmetics college, a TAFE. A 65 kilometer Russian military convoy moves towards the Ukrainian capital the Kyiv TV tower destroyed by a missile strike. The blast enormous, five killed. We visited the site as it was still burning. It looks like the target was this TV tower. You can still see smoke rising from the base here. It's difficult to tell from here just how much damage was inflicted, but if they wanted to bring it down, they failed. An attempt, say Ukrainian officials, to cut off the country from communications so Russia can control the narrative of this war. A war being fiercely fought from the air and on the ground. A tank firing directly at buildings near Kiev with people inside. All that remains now, rubble. But the focus is not just on the capital. Russia launches offences right around the country. Without mercy, this Russian bombardment in Chernihiv has left a school and homes levelled. And it doesn't stop. Another attack, this time in Kharkiv, residents once again running in terror. Forces start a siege of the southeastern port of Mariupol. A Russian tank fires at a residential block in Mariupol at close range, again and again. Minutes later, a group of civilians crawl out. This is life and death in the besieged city by the sea. Ukraine accuses Russia of bombing a maternity hospital, burying people in the rubble. Also targeted, a theatre in the city, killing at least 300 civilians sheltering there. Well, just when you thought uh, the situation couldn't get any worse here in Ukraine, now locals are dealing with the potential of a nuclear catastrophe overnight after Russian troops approached open fire and shelled uh, on and around a nuclear facility. In fact, the biggest not only in the country, but also the biggest in uh, Europe, Zaporizhka facility uh, near uh, en Energodar came under attack overnight and one building near one of the six reactors there caught fire. Now firefighters tried to get to the scene but were held back by uh, Russian fire at the time, ground fire from troops on the ground. They were begging for a ceasefire to enable those specialists and firefighters to get in to get that situation under control. We had the foreign minister of Ukraine saying that the shelling was coming from all sides and he said, quote, if it blows up it'll be ten times larger than Chernobyl. But the battle wasn't just in the south. Shocking evidence of war crimes would soon emerge. In Butcher. These are war crimes and they will be recognised by the world as genocide. You are here today and can see what happened. The town in Ukraine that is now firmly the centre of the world's attention. The scene of extraordinary actions by the Russian soldiers killing hundreds of civilians. We now know that some of them were tied up before they were shot dead. This road lined with Russian tanks destroyed when the Ukrainians were able to take this town back. But it is the scene of weeks of horror for the people who lived here. If they stepped outside, they were likely killed by the Russians who occupied this town. Shocking evidence of war crimes would soon emerge. 
hundreds of bodies of civilians are found in a mass grave in Buka. Many were bound and shot at close range, while others showed sign of torture and rape. The world was outraged. Bodies left in streets as Russian troops withdrew. Some shot in the back of the head with their hands tied behind their backs. Civilians executed with cold blood. Bodies dumped into mass graves. A sense of brutality and inhumanity left for all the world to see unapologetically. But the Ukrainian forces were not giving up. The Russians encountered stubborn resistance around Kyiv and their advances start to falter. The convoy of Russian tanks and military vehicles clog up roads and their logistics and communications break down. Russia's push to capture the Ukrainian capital has failed for now. April would see Russia launch what it called a new phase of the war. A Russian missile strike destroyed a train station in Kramatorsk, in Ukraine's east, killing at least 50 civilians, including women and children, and wounding more than 100. This catastrophe would instigate Moscow's pivot towards the east as it launched a new offensive to seize the Donetsk and Luhansk regions. Then, on a milestone day, a major blow to Moscow's naval supremacy and military prestige. The guided missile cruiser Moskva, its Black Sea flagship, sunk after an explosion and fire on board. Ukraine says it hit the ship with a missile. This said to be the impact. The loss of the ship was considered a Ukrainian win, despite the Kremlin's denials. Russia may have lost a ship, but they were about to claim a win. Ukrainian soldiers turned prisoners of war. They're victims of Russian success in eastern Ukraine. As a result of a successful offensive by Russia, 1,026 Ukrainian troops lay down their weapons and surrendered in the city of Mariupol. Russia says some went to hospitals, others headed to an unknown. We had to surrender, says this captured soldier, we'd been encircled. Putin declared Mariupol, quote, liberated after nearly two months of siege. But that wasn't entirely right. There was one holdout, the steelworks, where soldiers and civilians alike bunkered down, braving the onslaught. They've known nothing but darkness and the sound of bombs for two months. Finally emerging, women and children helped out of bunkers beneath Mariupol's steelworks plant, across the rubble and out of a city now unrecognisable to them. Here, a mother and her six-month-old baby, a third of his life, spent in war. This steel plant employee, so terrorised, she says she thought her heart would stop. Just the chance to breathe is overwhelming. With rare good news, President Zelensky said more than 100 civilians escaped, supported by the UN and the Red Cross. But as soon as the civilians were released, the Russian shelling recommenced, with hundreds of soldiers trapped inside. In Moscow, a show of might. Vladimir Putin presiding over a Victory Day parade, in the middle of a horrific war, far from being won. Vladimir Putin criticising America and NATO during his 11-minute Victory Day speech, falsely claiming the West was preparing to invade Russia to justify the current conflict. But as ordinary Russians tuned in to watch from home, TV menus were reportedly hacked with an anti-war message. The blood of thousands of Ukrainians and hundreds of murdered children is on your hands, no to war. The parade commemorates victory against the Nazis in World War II. Putin's military flex spoke volumes, even though he was silent on the reality of the frontline horrors. Back at Mariupol, the Russians had cause to celebrate. 53 badly wounded soldiers evacuated for treatment, but in a Russian stronghold. Another 211 escaped through a rare human corridor. No word on their status as prisoners of war. 
The deal was made by President Zelensky after troops spent 82 horrific days holed up in Ukraine's very symbol of resistance. He ruled it was time to save their lives. The operations commander declared the combat mission at Azovstal over. Ukraine says it delayed Russia's advance, inflicted casualties and bought time to reorganize. An apparent Russian victory of which there are few. This video, released by the Russians, shows Ukrainian soldiers being taken as prisoners of war. Putin ended the month by finally being able to declare legitimately full control of Mariupol. June 4, 2022. 100 days of war. 100 days of death, destruction, bloodshed and loss. Tens of thousands have lost their lives. Many were civilians. More than 12 million men, women and children forced from their homes. They're defending an almost deserted city. We're underground at the moment, in a basement where a lot of school children hid from the artillery. Ukraine's historical and cultural sites devastated by fighting. In Russia, major Western companies like McDonald's, Starbucks and Nike have fled in defiance, many replaced by cheap Russian imitations. Experts say these high-profile departures, along with continuing international sanctions, are crippling the Russian economy. However, there are debates about Russia's economic resilience and whether sanctions are actually the right approach, with some saying they affect ordinary Russians who have nothing to do with the war and could play into Putin's anti-Western rhetoric. By June 15, Zelensky pleads for more and faster deliveries of Western arms and weapons, which were crucial to defend Ukraine's east. NATO heard his call. But the arrival of arms would not be instant. Days after that announcement on June 25th, Ukrainian troops pull out of Severodonetsk, a strategic industrial city, one of Ukraine's last strongholds in the Luhansk region and one which Putin was desperate to win. And he did that by unleashing hell on the city. Russians outnumbered Ukrainian forces by 10 to 1. Russia's momentum continued into July. It was the last pocket of resistance in a key stronghold of Ukraine's east, Lysychansk. Now in Russian hands after weeks of brutal fighting. Russian President Vladimir Putin declaring his troops had liberated the region. They should rest, he said, then increase their combat capabilities. Russia refusing to relent. A massive 20% of Ukraine territory is now under threat. Today's victory secures one half of Donbass, the Luhansk region. Russia now focusing everything on winning the second, Donetsk. President of Ukraine, Volodymyr Zelensky. Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky has vowed they'll fight their way back. Evil has come to our land, he told us today. We will do everything to evict these war criminals. But it's a key loss in the four-month conflict. Ukraine shifts its focus and forces to defending Donetsk, the second part of the Donbass region. The Donbass, a heavily industrialised region, has now become the site of the biggest battle in Europe in generations. As winter sets in, Russia shuts down the Nord Stream gas pipelines in a bid to ratchet up pressure on Europe. European leaders are spooked, teetering on the edge of an energy supply disaster. After 11 days, Russia turns the gas back on. But Europe realises it needs to wean itself off Russian energy supplies. 
On the very same day, Ukraine and Russia agree to a landmark deal, allowing Ukrainian grain to be exported across the Black Sea. It is a major breakthrough, aimed at easing the global food crisis, as Ukraine is one of the world's biggest wheat exporters. With energy and food out of the firing line for now, July would end with a blow to Russia. Слово Хаймерс стало для нашої країни майже синонімом слова справедливість. Ukraine receives a donation from the US of the weapons they'd been crying out for. 12 high mobility artillery rocket systems or HIMARS, high-tech military equipment designed to hit targets quickly accurately and from a safe distance. A major improvement on the Army's conventional howitzers, which have a range of up to 40 kilometres. The tactical missiles capable of hitting targets from 300 kilometres. Ukraine wasted no time, destroying 50 Russian ammo depots and scores of logistics command and control systems with their shiny new American-made weapons of war. Videos emerge on social media, a day at the beach for Russian tourists, interrupted by immense and repeated explosions. The explosions happened at a Russian airbase, deep behind the front line in Crimea, and went on for an hour. Neither side would reveal what was behind the string of blasts, which destroyed several Russian planes and damaged more than 80 buildings. But Ukrainian Defence Minister Alexei Reznikov said that Russian army officers in the base had failed to observe a very simple rule. Don't smoke in dangerous places. For months, Ukraine and Russia have been flirting with catastrophe at the Zaporizhia nuclear plant in southern Ukraine. Given it's the biggest in Europe, fears of a disaster were very, very real. The head of the UN, Antonio Guterres, issued a grave warning to both Ukraine and Russia. We must tell it as it is. Any potential damage to Zaporizhia is suicide. Turkey's president said bluntly, the world doesn't want another Chernobyl. Russia's occupation of Europe's biggest nuclear power plant at Zaporizhia has kicked off alarm bells. The actions of Russian occupiers can be predicted, but the way of the radioactive cloud is absolutely not. It can go anywhere, hidden any part of Europe and even far beyond it. August 24. Ukraine celebrates 31 years of independence from the Soviet Union. But in Moscow, tributes for a murdered Russian TV star, Daria Dugina. She had been killed in a suspected car bomb attack in Moscow. Pieces of an exploded SUV litter a highway outside Moscow. Killed a pro-war journalist and commentator, Daria Dugina. People in the West are living in a dream, the 29-year-old told viewers last week. They need to be nourished by this war. But the intended target was believed to have been this man, her father, Alexander Dugin, also known as Putin's brain, a Russian ultra-nationalist and one of Putin's closest confidants. Russia blames the Ukrainian Secret Service for the attack and released what they say is a video of a woman breaking in and planting the bomb. Ukraine denies any involvement. Putin was furious and issued a warning on TV. Days later, on the last day of the month, Russia halts all gas exports to Europe again. Its state-owned energy giant Gazprom claimed that they're conducting maintenance work on the Nord Stream 1 pipeline. Prices surge immediately, leaving leaders in Europe fearful of a recession and supply shortage deep into winter. Ukrainian soldiers as the seven-month war turns back their way. Guys, let's wave, he says. Glory to Ukraine. Troops re-fly their national flag. 
and celebrate as they take back towns the Kremlin's forces had spent months fighting to win. After months of battle, the war-scarred cities of Izium and Kupiansk were reclaimed by Ukraine on the 10th of September. It was a significant strategic win for Kyiv. Ukraine claims that their counteroffensive in the northeastern Kharkiv region has liberated 1,000 square kilometres. Zelensky took the opportunity to farewell the retreating Russian troops. His troops beaten back in Ukraine, Vladimir Putin moves to reverse the tide of the war. In a national address, the Russian leader announces a partial military mobilisation, the call-up of reservists, necessary, he says, to stop the West dividing and destroying his country. Russia will defend itself with everything at its disposal, he says. That announcement triggered a mass exodus of Russians escaping conscription into neighbouring Georgia and Kazakhstan. Protests broke out across Russia, with more than a thousand people arrested. While many Russians revolt against the conscription, Ukraine forces would unearth what they say is more evidence of horrific war crimes. Another mass burial site uncovered in the recently liberated town of Izium. At the end of September, Putin made a move that would outrage the world. A referendum in four occupied regions held under a gun barrel in an attempt to take control in Ukraine's east. But Europe and the West had no time for his faux democracy. We do not accept the sham referendum and any kind of annexation in Ukraine. And we're determined to make the Kremlin pay for this further escalation. Putin, however, couldn't care less about what Europe said. On September 30, Russia annexes Donetsk, Kherson, Luhansk and Zaporizhia. Two, three, Just hours after Putin signed the annexation papers, Ukraine fought back. Once a strategic stronghold for Russia, the Ukrainian flag now flies in the war-ravaged town of Lehman. Signs of the Russian occupation stripped from the walls. But the embarrassments for Putin would not end there. October 7th was Putin's 70th birthday. One day later, a devastating blow. A suspected truck bomb detonates on Europe's longest bridge. The blast ignites seven fuel-carrying railway cars and collapses two sections of the 19-kilometre link. Russia's only road into Crimea, the Ukrainian peninsula it annexed eight years ago. Kirsch Strait Bridge is the primary supply line for Russian troops now fighting in southern Ukraine strategic and symbolic. Russia's Vladimir Putin drove a truck across the bridge in fanfare as it opened four years ago. For many Ukrainians, it's a monument to Russian control. Kyiv did not take responsibility for the blast, but Putin was quick to lay blame. Russia's prestige in the region was dealt a stinging blow, leading Putin to retaliate by unleashing a hail of missiles on Ukraine's capital. The drive to work, rocked by Vladimir Putin's spiteful revenge. <laughs> Dozens of rockets came down on cities across Ukraine, including the capital. Residential buildings, busy intersections, a children's playground. Here, a young woman describes her panic at one missile strike <laughs> when a second explodes nearby. The barrage just kept on coming, live on TV. Front lines uh, was hit uh, more than a dozen. So. Struck two, this Kyiv tourist hotspot, a glass pedestrian bridge. This woman alive by metres, seconds, 
and luck. The Kremlin saying it hit its targets that appeared to be civilians. 11 people killed, dozens injured. By mid-October, a new weapon supplied by Iran had entered the fray. Fresh hell. At dawn in the Ukrainian capital, Kyiv's air defences in overdrive, intercepting swarms of drones. Of 28, five got through. First came the buzzing, then the deadly blasts. Police and soldiers at checkpoints opening fire. Every gun towards the sky. Knowing if they miss, people could die. Yeah, Four civilians did. The victims inside this residential building, including a young couple expecting a baby. The nature and increased frequency of these attacks is yet another example of Putin's desperation. And while for the most part, it does just harden the determination of Ukrainians to win this war for the families of the victims, it is devastating. The drones destroyed key energy infrastructure in the capital and devastated civilian buildings. Putin's strategy was escalation, intended to break the national morale. Another attack, continued attack of Russia on Ukraine. Killed civilians. He started to be an enemy number one in history, not Hitler, Putin, number one. In Kyiv's metro, deep below ground, those taking shelter sang the national anthem. Their resolve tested once more. The first day of November and more missiles rained down upon Ukraine's capital. Russia launched dozens of cruise missiles at targets across the country. Authorities in Ukraine say 44 of the missiles were shot down by air defences, but the rest made it through, damaging critical infrastructure. Four out of five residents in Kyiv have no power, no electricity, and temperatures are falling below zero. Kyiv's mayor said Russia was carrying out genocide. I have a feeling the Russian, uh, uh, Russian aggressors uh, want to freezing people in this winter. They uh, cut it, they, they propose uh, himself as war against military, but right now have, uh, this war have directly impact in uh, civil population. Days later and Russia would backtrack on its peace deal to allow Ukrainian grain to be shipped out via the Black Sea meaning that food prices the world over would continue to climb. November 11, the day Ukraine's belief that they could win the war intensified. Liberation videos like this are flooding social media, strengthening Ukraine's belief that it can win this war. <laughs> Local villagers embrace their saviours, soldiers who raise their flag. Ukrainian troops pour into the city of Kherson, having forced the Russians to retreat. The strategically important southern port city was once home to 250,000 people and was one of the first to fall to Russian forces during the early days of the war. Just six weeks prior, Putin had declared the entire Kherson region was newly annexed Russian territory. But the Ukrainians fought back, forcing the 30,000 Russian troops into a hasty exit as they left behind ammunition and belongings. Five days later, a breaking news story that shocked the world. One of the two victims of that explosion in southeastern Poland farewelled today. A man remembered for sheltering Ukrainian refugees in the opening days of the invasion. Polish investigators search for missile shrapnel in the hunt to discover who brought Europe to the brink. Preliminary analysis suggests that the incident was likely caused by a Ukrainian air defence missile. But Ukraine President Volodymyr Zelensky has surprised the West, refusing to accept blame. 
I have no doubt, he said, that it was not our missile. Polish authorities believe the shrapnel proves it was an S-300 Soviet-era rocket used by Ukraine. This is one successfully striking its target mid-air. But yesterday's missed and strayed into Polish territory. Those innocent people would uh, not have been killed if there had been no Russian war. The end of the month saw Britain's new Prime Minister make his first visit to the capital. There, he announced a $90 million aid package for Ukraine, including anti-aircraft guns, just days after the heaviest airstrikes of the war so far. A wartime leader dressed in military green stepping back from the front line. Volodymyr Zelensky's first trip outside Ukraine, his country's future at stake. Embraced by a joint session of the US Congress, humbled by a hero's welcome and a standing ovation lasting two minutes. A high stakes, even dangerous visit planned under tight security and secrecy. First a train to Poland, then an American jet into Joint Base Andrews, carrying with him a military cross from one of his captains. US President Joe Biden tells Zelensky that Ukraine will never be alone and promised to send Patriot air defense systems to help Ukraine stave off Russian attacks on its energy infrastructure. Until now, the US had been reluctant to supply long-range weapons to Ukraine for fears of inflaming tensions with Russia. Having travelled from one of the most violent points on the eastern front line to the front steps of the White House, this moment a daring show of solidarity, one the world is watching, so too Vladimir Putin. President Biden announcing an extra $2 billion in military aid, including an American Patriot missile system plus almost $400 million for Ukrainians struggling without food, water and heating after targeted Russian missile strikes. Congress also poised to vote on a $45 billion long-term package. In the days before Christmas, Putin discussed an end to the conflict he started and for the very first time used the word war. The next day, Ukrainian officials broached the subject of peace but are very wary of trusting Putin. Discussions of peace were not long lived. From the ground, Ukraine's army attempted to thwart the aerial assault. 54 Russian missiles were brought down, but 15 made it through. Knocking out this electricity substation near Kharkiv, wrecking homes on the outskirts of Zaporizhia. I woke up to everything shaking and crumbling, she says. Homes were hit in the capital too. Ukrainian officials conceding some of the damage was caused by missiles falling after being shot down by air defences. Two people killed, six injured, including a 14-year-old girl. Ukraine's now familiar morning soundtrack sending thousands underground in search of safety. In the cold winter, cities were left without power. The Russians want to bring depression, especially right now, Christmas time, New Year. The, the Russians want to bring us to, to black time, to uh, without uh, lighting, to without heating. Putin was publicly commissioning new warships and submarines making the idea of peace seem hopelessly far-fetched. The first day of 2023, and Ukraine clapped back, dealing Russia one of its biggest blows of the war. Russian mothers and fathers mourning their sons. 
After one of the country's worst military losses since invading its neighbour, Ukraine used American-made rockets to carry out the strike, obliterating this building, housing hundreds of recently arrived, inexperienced Russian recruits. Some were using their mobile phones, helping Ukraine pinpoint their position. In a rare admission, Russia's defence ministry said 63 soldiers were killed. But so far, Vladimir Putin has said nothing amid renewed domestic criticism. Putin was defiant in his New Year's address, saying that Russia would never give in to the West. But days later, the Russian president proposed a 36-hour ceasefire to mark Orthodox Christmas. Many leaders were not so trusting that Putin would keep his word of a temporary truce. Ukrainian President Zelensky rejected the ceasefire, saying it was a trick to halt the progress of Ukraine's forces in the east. And it seems he may have been right. Despite Putin's unilateral ceasefire order, there were reports Russian troops opened fire 14 times during the first three hours of the truce. The war would soon see one of its bloodiest battles yet. Bakhmut and Solidar in the east came under intense attacks after Russian forces regrouped and changed tactics. The attacks caused heavy losses for Ukraine and prompted them to call on Western allies for more support. President Zelensky pleading for more weapons from the west, insisting Russia's terror can only be defeated on the battleground. That call was heard. The US announced a new $3.75 billion military aid package for Ukraine to include Bradley fighting vehicles for the first time. And then came the tanks. Back and forth, the UK, Germany and US seemed to be undecided as to whether supplying tanks would be the right course of action. Eventually, Britain made a decision. They would send a squadron of Challenger 2 tanks to help push back Russia's invasion. That made the UK the first Western power to supply the Ukrainians with main battle tanks. The UK urged Germany to contribute, but there was hesitation about sending heavy weaponry to the cause. But Washington's promise to deliver a significant number of US Abrams tanks appeared to break the deadlock on the issue. Germany soon followed, confirming they would send 14 Leopard tanks. And then the floodgates opened. Finland, Spain, the Netherlands and Norway would also contribute the same tanks. Poland committed more than 60 alone. An estimated 321 heavy tanks were promised, but their impact wouldn't be felt for months. Ukrainian soldiers had to be trained and the machinery itself delivered. The first are estimated to roll out by the end of March. But the war would not wait as Russia seemingly stepped up preparations for its next offensive. As the one-year anniversary approached, it became clear that the end of the conflict was far from sight. Intelligence experts and analysts said Russia was planning a major offensive to coincide with the day it first launched its attack. It was estimated that hundreds of thousands of conscripted Russian troops were being mobilised near the border. Vladimir Putin has long made comparisons of his war to the fight against Nazis in World War II. And in a national address, he doubled down. It's unbelievable but true. We are once again being threatened by German Leopard tanks and again they are going to fight Russia on Ukrainian soil through the last followers of Hitler. The Russian president has consistently falsely claimed Nazis lead Kyiv's government, returning to that theme before this vague nuclear threat to the West. We aren't sending our tanks to their borders, but we have things to respond with. It will not end with the use of armoured vehicles. Everybody should understand that. As the West prepares to send its tanks to the front line, the debate over whether they would help Ukraine in the air raged on. Zelensky was on a mission, making powerful appeals in the UK and France to plead his case for Western fighter jets. But allies were hesitant to commit to sending planes. 
A major issue was one of practicality. They're very hard to pilot. However, the UK has committed to helping Ukrainian soldiers learn to fly them. To train their pilots on advanced combat aircraft. So but stopped short of agreeing to send any. The day after Zelensky's tour of European allies, Russia launched a large-scale missile attack, striking several cities, including the capital. Since then, Russian forces mounted round-the-clock attacks on Ukraine's east. Putin was throwing more and more troops into battle. The head of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres, issued a grave warning that the war could expand beyond Ukraine. Untold suffering on the Ukrainian people with profound global implications. The prospects for peace keep diminishing. The chances of further escalation and bloodshed keep growing. I fear the world is not sleepwalking into a wider war. I fear it's doing so with its eyes wide open. Days later, and the US Secretary of State dropped a revelation that China was considering partnering up with Russia. For the first deadly year of Russia's Ukraine invasion, China has been the superpower on the sidelines, appearing hands off, claiming it wants peace. Now, America's senior diplomat says he used Munich talks with his Chinese opposite number to warn Beijing, don't arm Russia. We have information that gives us concern that they are considering providing lethal support to Russia in, uh, in the war against Ukraine. The Secretary of State says China's warming relations with Vladimir Putin's Russia has already led to some non-lethal support, making it military would threaten US-China relations. I made clear the importance of not crossing that line. Zelensky drew a line in the sand, declaring there would be a world war if China did support Russia. the US has maintained a strong alliance with Ukraine throughout the war, strengthened even further by the surprise visit of President Biden. Just days before the one-year anniversary, Biden travelled to Kyiv, defying threats of Russian missile attacks as air raid sirens blasted around him. The president announced a new package of additional U.S. weapon supplies worth 500 million U.S. dollars and reiterated his country's support for Ukraine. February 24, 2023, one year of death, of destruction, of devastation. The toll of this war has been enormous on both sides. Nearly 200,000 Russian troops are estimated to have lost their lives. And 100,000 Ukrainian soldiers and 30,000 civilians have lost theirs. It is an extreme price to pay for so little. Many are hoping for an end to this conflict swiftly. One year on, and it seems an armistice is far from sight. But there is one thing we can be certain of. This war has changed the world forever. It has shown that the atrocities of past global conflicts are not just relics of the past. History has a habit of repeating itself, and we can only hope that this war does not follow that path. My home was broken. Everybody had to leave and hide in a safe place. I just want the war to be over.